Hello Unity fans! In the previous video, we've polished our woodcutter's basic movement and interaction with trees. We've already worked on the shiver when the axe hits a tree, as well as the swaying in the wind. But today we're adding some more complex dynamics to the trees. We're adding some life to our trees by letting them grow slowly over time and letting them fall over realistically after being chopped. These changes require our woodcutter to also view trees in more detail since it has to wait for a tree to be fully grown before chopping it down. Remember to visit previous videos in this series if the origin of some of the code and functionality isn't clear to you. I'll put links in the description and the top right. Let's see how we can incorporate these changes. There's a useful tool we need to implement before we can get our trees going over time. We'll have many resources and we'd want to apply some gradual change over time to many of them. Checking and possibly changing the state of every resource for every single frame may become resource intensive. We can reduce the CPU load by only checking for updates at fixed time intervals. I'm using a system I found in a CodeMonkey tutorial, namely a time tick system. Have a look at his tutorial, linked to in the description and the top right, if you want to see this system implemented in more detail. I'll summarize it here for our purposes. The idea is that, rather than having a thousand trees, each keeping track of its own growth progress every frame by increasing its own counter by the time passed for that frame, we can have one central time ticking system that keeps track of time passed. Depending on how smooth you want the changes to be, you can specify the length of one tick, for example 0.2 seconds for 5 ticks per second. Each object that is required to keep track of time can simply subscribe to this time ticker and fire off its instructions whenever receiving a trigger that a tick has occurred. If your game is running at 60 frames per second, you don't have a thousand trees checking on the time and possibly changing its state slightly 60 times a second anymore but only one process checking on the time 60 times a second, while each of the thousand trees is instructed to perform its update only five times during each second. As soon as a subscribed object gets news of the trigger, it will execute its on-trigger event. You can also define periods of differing lengths by having multiples of the basic tick length. For example, we also have a period of five ticks in length to which objects can subscribe. We'll call this a mega tick. So we'll let each of our trees subscribe to this mega time tick system and then keep track of the number of ticks rather than milliseconds each frame. And whenever the event triggers, the tree will execute the specified function. Here you can see the system implemented for dissolving the tree after it has fallen. You can see that the scale of the tree adjusts once every second or five ticks and that it completely dissolves in five rather jumpy steps but this is only a placeholder to get it out of the way for now. When applying very small incremental changes over long periods, an update every second should be just fine and unnoticeable. For each resource type, we'll specify in our resource spec class how many mega ticks it takes before the resource can be harvested. When creating the tree object, we then set our mega ticks to go variable equal to this parameter. Note that we're building in a multiplier to give you some extra control over the number of ticks. You can let individual trees grow slower or faster by adjusting the multiplier either side of 1. After setting the ticks to go value, we adjust the scale of the tree by interpolating between the zero size scale and the full size scale. We parameterize both of these to allow you to start a resource at some size other than completely invisible and end up at a size other than the exact original prefab scale. Now, after each 5 tick trigger is registered, we will reduce our ticks to go variable, making sure that it does not go below zero, which would cause negative scaling. Every time the ticks to go value is updated, we also adjust the scale of the tree. When it gets to zero, we set the can harvest flag to true. Let's set our mega ticks before ripe value to 100 seconds for wood so that a tree will grow from being planted to fully grown in 100 seconds. We see the growth is quite choppy since each second adds 1% of the total scale to the size. This may be fine for a mobile game in which processor use have to be minimized and trees need to grow quite fast. 
but more often we will need trees that grow a lot slower. For example, setting the mega ticks value to 600, which means a tree completes an entire growth cycle in 10 minutes of playtime, our growth is a lot smoother, while still requiring an update only once per second. And if you need it to look even smoother, you can merely reduce the length of a tick to whatever suits you and adjust the mega ticks required value accordingly. Either way, you now have complete control over the trade-off between smooth changes and processing power. Now we need our woodcutter to only target full-grown trees to prevent things like this from happening. However, we may also find ourselves in situations later where we actually do want to search for trees that are not necessarily fully grown. So in order to make our search algorithm adjustable, we add a parameter that indicates whether only harvestable resources should be considered. This needs to also be passed to the algorithm that finds a target hex, so it only considers hexes with at least one full-grown tree on it. Our condition is now adjusted to incorporate this option. So if the option is set to true, it only considers trees that can be harvested, while it considers any tree if the option is set to false. If we run our game with these changes in place, we see that woodcutters now correctly only target full-grown trees. However, saplings can still interfere with the position of the woodcutter and falling trees on the hex. A sapling can easily be crushed by a falling tree. One way to prevent this from happening is to add an additional constraint to the search algorithm. We consider only hexes where all the trees on the hex are fully grown. This will ensure that the woodcutter only starts working on a hex when there are no saplings present and he will then automatically start at the nearest tree as before. Finally, we need to let our trees fall realistically after being chopped. We handle the first part of the fall in the same way as the shivering and swaying by rotating the tree slightly in the direction in which we want it to fall. We specifically want to control this direction to be the 45 degree line between the woodcutter's right and behind him as he chops, since this would prevent the tree from crashing into other trees and also provide us with some space to the left and behind the woodcutter to later place the carrying basket and some tools while he's chopping. It turns out the unit's forward position is not as we see it visually when he's chopping, but using forward plus right gives us the intended direction. We scale this by 10, since the Shiver Me Timbers script actually applies not only the direction, but also the magnitude of the vector, and we don't want the rotation to be so slight that the tree takes too long to fall when the physics takes over. What do I mean by physics? Well, let's see what happens. When his axe hits the tree for the final time, we save his direction at that moment. Next, we define functions that should happen only after some time has passed. Firstly, we let the tree fall two seconds later, while we let it start dissolving to get out of the way six seconds later. We also indicate that the chopping action has been completed, but only after 0.25 seconds to give the chopping animation time to blend into the walking animation. Now, the falling tree function consists of setting the parameters of the Shiver Me Timbers script such that a rotation to the backed up direction is performed for one second. We set timber to true to indicate that the tree has begun falling. In the Shiver Me Timbers script, the first second is spent rotating the tree in the desired direction, and then the object's physics is switched on by switching off the kinematic parameter. Until now, the object's rigid body component, which controls its physics, has been set to kinematic, which means physics has been disabled. By switching is kinematic off, gravity starts impacting the tree, and since it has already been rotated slightly in the correct direction, it will continue falling in that direction. In order to let it interact with the ground, we need it to have a collider. A capsule collider runs along the tree trunk. However, with only this collider, the tree would roll quite freely after hitting the ground, as if it was a smooth capsule. To let it settle in place fast, we add a box collider as well, with a slightly larger radius. When the tree hits the ground, the flat surfaces of the box collider quickly stabilizes it on the ground, but still leaves room for a slight jolt before coming to rest. Increasing the angular drag to 1 also reduces any tendency to roll or spin. And with that, we have a nice interaction going between our woodcutter and the trees, 
We still need to add steps where the carry basket can be empty, where the woodcutter can put it down before chopping, as well as walk to the fallen tree and saw it into logs, while the carry basket gradually fills up with logs. After which he picks up a full basket and carries it to his hut. But in order to get there, we first need to spend some time on the parameterization and interaction of our woodcutter characters. In the next couple of videos, we will see how we can randomize our characters so they don't all look the same, while also allowing us to set some of their parameters and have it influence their visuals, for example, empty versus full carry baskets. Please stay tuned to the channel for more. Goodbye!